In 1959, while most Americans still believed that space travel was science fiction, the United States Army quietly came to an extraordinary conclusion. The moon wasn't just a destination, it was a territory. Declassified documents reveal blueprints for a permanent base on the lunar surface. Project Horizon, a United States military base on the moon. They calculated hundreds of launch schedules. We see plans for multiple nuclear reactors buried under the lunar soil and discussions of staffing rotations. Defensive capabilities are discussed on the strategic importance of a moon base. It's a high priority target. Now these aren't ethereal concepts or theories because we're looking at the detailed plans and the requirements. It's all declassified for your convenience. The documents spell it out clearly. If the Soviet Union reached the moon first, the United States would lose more than just a space race. It was about the bigger picture, strategic dominance of a future battlefield. So the U.S. military made preparations to make sure that that never happened. I'm John Genoa, and you're watching America's Strangest History. This is the story of the U.S. government's forgotten plan to colonize the moon. This is Project Horizon. In the late 50s, the United States military was prepared to occupy the moon. In this period, space wasn't viewed as a scientific frontier. That's the contemporary view. The moon was high ground. The Cold War was defined by a single fear. Surprise. Surprise attack. Surprise technological breakthrough. In this case, surprise loss of a strategic advantage. And when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik in 1957, it wasn't just a scientific milestone. It was interpreted inside the Pentagon as proof that the Soviets could place payloads over the United States at will. Missiles and satellites were viewed as one in the same. If a nation could place an object into orbit, it could also deliver a weapon across continents. And by 1958, U.S. military planners weren't asking whether space would be militarized. They were asking who would control it first. The moon entered the picture almost immediately Immediately. From a military standpoint, it offered three things that the Earth orbit could not. First, permanence. An orbital platform passes overhead for minutes at a time. A lunar base, on the other hand, that never moves. It's a fixed position. Second, perspective. From the moon, the entire Earth-facing hemisphere is visible on predictable cycles. Surveillance, communications, and tracking accuracy all improve with distance and stability. Third, denial. If one power established a permanent presence first, it could claim de facto control of critical lunar terrain and force rivals to respond from positions of disadvantage. That's a real problem for national security. We see this reasoning popping up repeatedly in classified assessments. Space was no longer sitting above the battlefield, it was becoming the battlefield. It was in this environment, before astronauts and before the public narrative of peaceful exploration, that the United States Army issued a formal requirement, colonize the moon. In 1959, the United States Army formally set something in the motion that still surprises people to this day. It issued a classified requirement for a manned military outpost on the moon. It became known as Project Horizon. The language in the document isn't speculative. It's direct, operational, and urgent. The report states that there's a requirement for a manned lunar outpost to protect the United States' interests, also to develop surveillance, communication capabilities, and to support military operations on the lunar surface if required. So this wasn't a long-term dream. Project Horizon projected the first U.S. soldiers landing on the moon by 1965 with a fully operational base by 1966. The plan called for a permanent outpost staffed by 12 personnel living on the moon continuously continuously with rotations and resupply missions scheduled years in advance. The Army planned to build a base using buried cylindrical modules that were covered in lunar soil to protect against radiation, micrometeoroids, and temperature extremes. Power didn't come from the solar panels alone. The documents describe nuclear reactors that were installed beneath the surface to provide continuous energy for life support, communications, and operations. This was supposed to be a fortified installation. The moon in these documents is explicitly treated as a military theater. The report discusses surveillance of Earth and space. We see plans for communication relays and the strategic advantage of occupying lunar terrain before a rival power. Being second to the moon, the report warns, would be catastrophic for American prestige and influence. In other words, Project Horizon wasn't about exploration, it was about control, and the Army believed it was achievable with the technology already under development. Remember, that's in the 1950s. Now, fast forward to 2025, and we've purportedly accomplished very little progress to this goal. The idea of a moon base didn't start with astronauts, it started with missiles. 
In the mid-50s, the United States military wasn't thinking about exploration. It was thinking about delivery systems, intercontinental ballistic missiles, early warning radars, long-range detection networks. These are all being developed in parallel. Space was simply the next extension of that system. When the Soviet Union launched Sputnik in October 1957, the shock inside the Pentagon had nothing to do with satellites. Sputnik proved that the Soviets could build large rockets, achieve orbital velocity, predict trajectories, and place objects over the U.S. territory. Now, those weren't scientific achievements. They were targeting problems. They presented a big problem, potential disaster. Within months, U.S. military analysts began mapping what they called cislunar space. It's the region of space between the Earth and the Moon. Now, that space was important because anything placed there was hard to track. It was hard to intercept. It was also hard to counter. By 1958, internal Army and Air Force studies were already discussing whether Earth-based radar alone would ever be enough to detect launches or weapons deployed beyond orbit. The Moon appeared in these studies for one reason distance. From a moon base, missile launches from Earth could be observed earlier than from ground-based radar systems. Space objects could be tracked against the blackness of space instead of atmospheric clutter. Communication relays could operate without orbital decay. This is when the moon quietly shifted categories from science to infrastructure. By early 1959, the Army concluded that waiting for civilian space programs to mature was a strategic risk. So it issued a classified directive to study something no nation had ever attempted, a permanent military outpost on another world. Now that directive became Project Horizon. And from that point forward, the question was no longer, should we? It was, how fast can we get this done? Once Project Horizon was approved for study, the Army immediately ran into its real enemy, time. Not technology, not physics, just time. The U.S. was working against the clock. The documents make this unmistakably clear. Army planners believed the Soviet Union could land a human on the moon by the mid-60s. Reports show that some estimates predicted the Soviets doing it by 1965. That single assumption drove everything that followed. The Horizon timeline was brutal. The first unmanned cargo flights were scheduled to begin before any American astronaut went into space. By April 1965, the plan called for two Army personnel landing on the moon not to explore, but to verify construction zones and confirm that previous robotic deliveries had arrived intact. Now, these first two people weren't meant to stay long. Their landing vehicle was designed with an immediate return capability because the Army expected that the surface conditions would be uncertain and potentially hostile. Only after that verification mission would construction begin. By 1965 and 1966, the plan called for continuous cargo landings, heavy construction equipment, deliveries of fuel, oxygen, nitrogen, water shipments prefabricated habitat modules. By late 1966, the documents project a 12-man crew living on the moon continuously. The schedule wasn't optimistic, it was aggressive by design. The report repeatedly warns that delays would have cascading effects and that waiting even a single year could mean losing the strategic initiative entirely. One passage is especially blunt. It states that delayed action followed by a crash program would result in higher costs, lower reliability, and a greater chance of failure. In other words, the Army believed hesitation was more dangerous than risk. This is why Horizon reads less like a research proposal and more like a war plan, because in the late 1950s, that's exactly how it was treated. Project Horizon didn't exist in isolation. At the same time the Army was planning to live on the moon, the U.S. Air Force was planning how to fight there. And in 1959, the Air Force Special Weapons Center launched a classified study known as Project A-119. Its purpose was simple, determine what would happen if the United States detonated a nuclear device on the moon. The study examined visibility from Earth, radiation effects, seismic responses, and how such a detonation would be interpreted by the Soviet Union. This was treated as a legitimate military and psychological operation. The goal wasn't destruction, it was demonstration. A nuclear explosion on the moon would be visible from Earth. It would prove technological dominance and it would signal that the United States could reach operate and weaponize cislunar space. Now at the same time, a separate Air Force program was taking shape. They called it LUNIX. Now unlike Horizon, which was run by the Army, LUNIX was an Air Force lunar expedition plan. It outlined a manned lunar landing followed by a permanent Air Force controlled presence on the moon. Now declassified documents for Project LUNIX included a detailed system architecture. We see launch schedules and budgets, abort scenarios, 
cargo delivery plans, and a timeline aimed for the 1960s. Now, in other words, while the Army was planning to occupy the moon, the Air Force was planning how to get there first and then how to stay. It's strange because these programs didn't contradict each other so much as they overlapped. They also reinforced the same conclusion from different branches of the military. The moon is a future military territory, and we needed a moon base. So Project Horizon wasn't a rogue idea. It was part of a broader classified consensus. Project Horizon didn't speak in abstractions. It specified measurements. The living quarters weren't futuristic domes or glass bubbles. They were modified fuel tanks. Each habitat module was designed as a steel cylinder 10 feet in diameter and 20 feet long. So these weren't purpose-built homes. Instead, we see repurposed rocket tanks that were chosen because they were engineered to withstand pressure, temperature swings, and structural stress. Once unloaded onto the lunar surface, the tanks were buried beneath several feet of lunar soil. They were sealed and pressurized and connected by airtight passageways. Now, in this case, the lunar soil wasn't decorative. It was armor. A few feet of regolith would provide radiation shielding equivalent to thick concrete. It also effectively eliminates the threat posed by constant micrometeorite impacts. The base wasn't meant to be visible from orbit, and it was meant to survive. Power was handled with planned redundancies. Solar panels were unreliable because lunar nights lasted 14 Earth days, so the plan specified small nuclear reactors installed in separate excavated shafts far enough from the living quarters to reduce radiation exposure. The reactors would supply uninterrupted power for critical functions. Life support, communications, construction equipment, surface vehicle traffic, scientific instruments. So the document specified reactor redundancy. Redundancy. Failure wasn't an option. The moon base needed to be permanent and safe. The crew size was fixed at 12, and they didn't arrive at that number for comfort. It was about logistics. Six of the 12 were expected to spend most of their time maintaining systems just to keep the base operational. Air, power, waste recycling, communications, temperature control. To be clear, this wasn't a research team. We're talking survival. The plan even accounted for accidents. Pressurized lunar surface vehicles were designed to extend the base's operational range and retrieve stranded personnel. They'd move cargo across rough terrain. And the Army didn't assume everything would go right. It actually planned for breakdowns, for injuries, for rescue. This wasn't speculative science. We're seeing contingency planning. One of the most surprising details buried in these documents is how Project Horizon assumed a brute force execution. The launch numbers alone are staggering. Over 200 heavy rocket launches projected in less than a decade. And not for exploration, for logistics. Things like fuel, water, oxygen, construction equipment, reactors, vehicles, replacement parts. This was a supply chain. To make that supply chain work, the Army planned something even more radical. They intended to build fuel depots in Earth's orbit. Instead of sending fully fueled rockets directly to the moon, payloads would be launched in pieces, they'd be assembled or refueled in orbit, and then sent onward after that. The system dramatically reduced risk and increased payload size. In other words, the Army was planning orbital infrastructure before the first American astronaut flew into space. They also planned redundancy. It's a common theme here. If a lunar landing failed, another vehicle would be already on the way. If a crew was stranded, a rescue mission was pre-scheduled. If a launch window was missed, the plan shifted rather than stopped. The documents read like this because the Army expected losses. Now, not catastrophic failure, but routine failure. It's a detail that rarely gets mentioned. The planners assumed that some rockets would fail, some landings would go wrong, some equipment would arrive damaged or unusable. The program absorbed the losses in advance. It tells you how serious they were. And yet, despite all the planning, the diagrams, the budgets, Project Horizon purportedly never left the drawing board, if you can believe that. Project Horizon didn't fail because it was unrealistic. It failed because the rules of the game changed, and they changed fast. In 1958, while the Army and the Air Force were drafting lunar base plans, the United States created a new civilian agency, NASA. Now on paper, NASA was about exploration, but in reality, it was about control of the narrative. The government needed a public-facing space program that didn't look like a military escalation into orbit and beyond. At the same time, another force entered the picture, money. Project Horizon's projected cost was roughly $6 billion in 1950. 
59. Now adjusted for inflation, that's tens of billions today. And that was just for an initial outpost. Sustaining the base would have required continuous launches, constant resupply, and permanent military staffing on another world. It's not insignificant. Inside the Pentagon, a new kind of thinking was taking over. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara pushed for centralized control, cost efficiency, and systems that could produce immediate deterrence. Intercontinental ballistic missiles did just that. A moon base did not. Then came the final nail. In the early 60s, the United States and the Soviet Union quietly began negotiating what space was allowed to be. Those talks culminated in the Outer Space Treaty. No weapons of mass destruction in space. No military installations on celestial bodies. No national sovereignty beyond Earth. A permanent military base on the moon was not just expensive, but now it was illegal. By the time the Apollo missions captured center stage of the public's imagination, the military plans were already being buried. They were quietly shelved. The moon didn't stop being valuable, it just stopped being politically usable. In 2002, more than 40 years after Project Horizon was written, a Scottish system administrator named Gary McKinnon made claims that directly contradicted this. McKinnon didn't work for the U.S. military, and he didn't work for NASA. But over a 13-month period, he illegally accessed dozens of U.S. government computers. This included systems connected to NASA, the U.S. Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. The government described it as the largest military computer intrusion of its time. Now, McKinnon has always maintained that his goal wasn't espionage. He said he was searching for evidence that the U.S. government was suppressing information about UFOs. According to McKinnon, while browsing a government system, he accessed a spreadsheet with a title he'd never seen before, non-terrestrial officers. That phrase or designation isn't a U.S. military designation, at least none that I know of. McKinnon said that the spreadsheet contained names and ranks, but that the list of ranks didn't correspond to any known U.S. military branch. Now, to be clear, he didn't say the document listed aliens, and he didn't say that it identified extraterrestrial species. What he said, consistently, is that the organizational structure and the terminology didn't match any recognized military hierarchy. Then there's the photo. He said the document also referenced fleet-to-fleet -fleet transfers. It's a curious language. In standard U.S. military usage, fleet refers to naval formations operating on Earth. Now, McKinnon said that the way the term was used didn't align with conventional Navy administration. Now, he never released the document. He never copied it. There's no surviving version, and everything that we know about it comes from his testimony alone. Then there's the image. McKinnon said he accessed a high-resolution lunar photograph on a NASA computer at the Johnson Space Center. Photo P790011-1247 said it wasn't a low-quality scan. It was detailed. An original photograph. It's a large object above the lunar surface, and it wasn't a crater or a ridge, and it also wasn't a shadow on the ground. He said the object was metallic, elongated, it was cigar-shaped, and it had sharp edges. Cast a shadow suggesting solid form. Now, he didn't say that it was a base or that it was extraterrestrial, just what he saw. He thought it was artificial because it didn't resemble any kind of natural lunar feature that he was familiar with. Now, when he tried to download the image, things went off track. McKinnon said that he was using a 56K dial-up modem. The file was large. The download was extremely slow. Before it was completed, his connection dropped. Tragic. He's always maintained that the disconnection wasn't accidental, but there's no proof that it was intentional. There's no proof that it wasn't as well. What is verifiable is this. He never obtained the image. No copy exists in the public domain. NASA has never acknowledged the photo, and it was around this time McKinnon's unauthorized access was discovered. The United States charged him with multiple offenses and sought extradition. He faced the possibility of decades in prison. The legal battle lasted nearly 10 years, and ultimately the United Kingdom blocked extradition on medical and human rights grounds. McKinnon was never tried in the United States, and his claims were never formally addressed. There's no proof that the spreadsheet referred to off-world personnel. There's no proof that the image shows a moon base. There's no proof that he's lying as well. So, we have documented declassified military plans that treated the moon as territory, parallel programs that considered nuclear detonations and permanent occupation. Decades later, a hacker claimed to see evidence that those plans never fully ended. I suppose it's a matter of credibility. A document we can't examine. An image we want to see that never finished downloading. Also a government response that focused entirely on the hacking, not necessarily the substance of what he said he saw. Now, it doesn't prove the existence of a moon base, 
space, but it's something to think about. Today we see changing language. Cislunar Space is back in official documents, and they're talking about a permanent presence on the moon. Commercial and scientific institutions now replaced overt military action. First we had Project Horizon, and now we have SpaceX with plans to set up a permanent presence on the moon. It's back on the table, or maybe it never left. So, the government plans were real, the claims about non-terrestrial officers came later. I'm John Genoa, this is America's Strangest History. What do you think? Was Project Horizon really scrapped? I mean, the plans were drawn up, it was ready to go. Secret government projects? There's no dispute about this. Do we believe Gary McKinnon's claims about a mysterious photo? Maybe it shows a vehicle, maybe a base. Maybe they've been running a lunar base there since the 50s and the 60s. Can you imagine that?